like to thank the uh, organizers for the opportunity to talk about some of the latest work we've been doing on vascular imaging uh, with the Mars uh, team. And there's the immediate vascular team. Um, so the Mars team, of course, does a lot of the heavy lifting. So the list of names there are the ones who sort of do the immediate stuff. And uh, you can see it's very mixed group. Uh, biochemists, uh, surgeon Professor Justin Roke who provides us with all our bits of um, patients and whole patients. Uh, and we've got our usual mixture of uh, physicists and um, radiologists in there. So it's a very uh, dynamic and mixed group, um, very strongly supported by the rest of the Mars team. So uh, my apologies for, to anybody who feels they've done a huge amount of heavy lifting in the com computation, particularly Stephen Bell, um, who hasn't been listed as the immediate vascular team. Um, I'm technically head of the uh, imaging team, which just means I've got to pull it all together and explain what we're finding. The motivation behind this is that imaging the vasculature is hard. And the reason we want to measure and image the vasculature is because of this disease, cardiovascular disease. The pathology is known as atherosclerosis. This is the growth. And the overall disease or its complications and symptoms is called cardiovascular, as in it's the disease of the cardiovascular, the arteries leading from the heart. This doesn't happen in the veins. It is not, as you would hear described in the media, and GPs who should be resigning for saying it, a deposit of cholesterol in the arteries. Um, to put it the most politest terms, it's the biggest load of bollocks out. It's pus. It's the buildup of pus in the artery wall, driven by an inflammatory process within the artery wall. And it particularly happens around bifurcations and high pressure points in the body. And the classic, of course, is in the heart here in the bifurcations. Um, big bifurcation here um, of the artery going up in your neck into your brain. Uh, it's called the carotid artery, and it causes a large percentage of strokes. So you get this buildup of pus growing in the artery wall. So there's the general process. <coughs> very, th these slides very much uh, summarize a lot of very complicated inflammatory processes. But the key event is the monocytes being recruited down into the wall of the artery. So up here, you've got your blood flowing. This is the smooth muscle cells that forms that nice elastic, bouncy bit around the arteries. This is extremely exaggerated. In reality, it's only about that thick but it'll look a bit silly having a macrophage squash just for the drawing. Um, so this is usually a very, very thin layer full of collagen, elastic material, and it's what the endothelial cells bind to, so it forms the bridge between the endothelial cells and the muscle layer. But an inflammatory event happens in here. The monocytes go in. They turn into macrophages. Macrophages are the workhorse of the immune system. They clean up, repair, destroy, present antigens, produce free radicals, um, and they produce lots of inflammatory things, that chemicals that attract more of these monocytes into here. So you end up with an influx of these. This is pus. This is just like you get a cut in your hand and it gets infected. It builds up. And it also starts to damage cholesterol going past. The cholesterol particles could load density lipoprotein. And these cells then see these as damaged um, cells and mistakenly take up large quantities of the damaged cholesterol particles. And they turn into these big fat foam cells. And that means they, their metabolism goes a bit funny. They don't leave. You build up this pus layer. And then this happens over many years. It starts in the teens. Uh, in, uh, the Western world for some reason, and then it continues to grow. And if you're lucky, you'll reap the right old age and won't get bad enough to cause a problem. But for a large percentage of people, it does. And what happens is this layer here gets so ballooned out, it actually starts to restrict the flow of blood. You get high blood pressure and lots of other symptoms. And the worst case scenario is this thing becomes stable, cracks open. This gruelly, pussy material causes the clotting of blood. You get a blood clot. And the blood clot either blocks the flow of blood past here, or sometimes even worse, it goes further up into the brain or into the smaller arteries of the heart, blocks them, and you end up with a heart attack or stroke. The real big problem with cardiovascular disease is that it's asymptomatic. So who's got cardiovascular disease in this room? One person's put their hand up. The rest of you probably have, but you just don't know it. And the biggest problem, the usually the... The, the biggest symptom of cardiovascular disease is death, which tends to limit your ability to treat a patient. 
So it's quite catastrophic. Generally, for these people, there's no symptoms. In fact, 20% uh, th the number I've seen bandied around at conferences, though I've yet to track down the paper with it, and it's probably buried somewhere in the stats area of um, literature, um, people don't even have any symptoms at all. So it's a real problem. Nobody goes to the doctor and says, I have a fatty streak, which is the first layer, the start of this pus building down in the arteries. And the real big problem is, because we've got nothing else, doctors and the medical profession in general, I say medical, from scientists all the way through to the surgeons have concentrated on the risk factors. Family history, blood cholesterol, uh, blood pressure, smoking, diabetes, weight. These are all things that they can also can manipulate. So to be fair, people want outcomes, changes. So these are things that have been focused on. Blood cholesterol has been emphasized a huge amount. It's a really poor indicator of cardiovascular disease, but it's easily manipulated by a pile of drugs. Interestingly, the same drugs also turn out to be very good anti-inflammatories. And remember, I said this is, an in, this is an inflammatory disease. So unfortunately, treatment is based on lipid lowering, reducing other symptoms, breathlessness, um, ulcers, all sorts of things that come with this disease. Unlike cancer, it's not based on the reduction of plaque size or changing the morphology. And in cancer, you want the lesion to go. You want it to get smaller. You want it to become benign. You want to have it cut out. We can't even see the lesion is the big problem in cardiovascular disease. So there's a snapshot of the various, folk, uh, various imaging modalities. This is CT on the side. And the only way to light up the arteries in the CT really effectively is to stick an iodine-based contrast agent in there. So you can see on this person there is a narrowing of the artery, little lump in there. That might or may not be calcium, we don't know. You know CT just absorbs x-rays, that's all you can say about it. Here's a uh, higher resolution one, this is a CT angiography, and you can see there's something in there restricting the blood flow, but we get no idea what it is. Ultrasound, we can sort of see shadows of stuff, uh, calcium blocks the ultrasound. Um, it gets, we sort of pick up stuff, but not much. You can't tell whether it's inflamed, whether it's getting bigger or smaller. Um, there's a lot of studies claiming this, but you talk to any sonographer, they start laughing because the image size is very dependent on the operator. Um, it's a real art ultrasound. Um, I know some people like to make out that it's easy. Pick up a probe, you can look at anything. No, it's a real art. So. This is very operator dependent, but they can pick up very clearly this flow of blood through this narrowing. The gold standard is IVUS, which is, means cutting a hole in the uh, groin artery and threading a catheter up the groin artery into your arteries. That will tell you whether you do or don't have cardiovascular disease. Who wants to have that done? Last time I asked this question, two people put their hands up. Everybody moved away from them, assuming they were crazy. It's got a 1% death rate. Um, it's a good chance that you're sticking something up in here. You might poke this open. It does give you a really good view of what's going on inside the artery, but only in the artery you enter, so you don't actually get to see much. So the real big problem is these plaques are small. So thickness-wise, you're talking about an advanced one being 2 to 3 millimeters. Well, that's what? About the best 6 pixels? on a CT machine, and it's made of the same sort of stuff, really, that the artery's made of. So there's not really many Hounsfield units difference when you just look at the raw absorption of the photons. So it's very difficult to pick up these key aspects, these key signatures that you can see in histology after the patient has died. Um, you know, what's going on with the artery. So you get necrotic cores. This is this big layer of dead cells in here. The plaque's got so thick these cells have died. Fibrous cap, that's a good sign. It's, it's uh, um, sealing itself off, but that fibrous cap becomes thin. It's going to rupture. If it ruptures, you get blood trapped in there. So you end up with what's known as interplaque hemorrhage, and that actually causes oxidative stress, which causes more damage. Calcification. We're not fully sure what microcalcification means, but eventually the calcification gets so big the artery just becomes a solid lump and therefore doesn't uh, um, respond to the high dynamic changes with blood pressure and stuff. What we really want to be able to see is these fatty streaks, which are the most about half a millimeter thick. So quite a challenge imaging wise. So over the last, and it surprised me, this last 10 years, we have been collecting, well, 
we've been collecting plaques and imaging, but our collection of plaques, actually, my lab goes back 15 years, so we've been doing this for about five years before we approached Phil Butler and said, hey, do you want some plaques? Um, very quickly, we suddenly found ourselves supplying plaques to Mars. So our surgeons phone us up. They have gone into the side of somebody's neck. Uh, you can see in the surgery here, and that's the carotid artery. So if you take your hand, stick it under your jaw, those who want to find out what the, where it is. So that thumping thing in there, that's the carotid bifurcation that you can feel in there. And that's a major site of plaque growth. Um, and the surgeons treat that if it's not responding to drugs. Generally, when a patient turns up with uh, problems here, they've had a stroke or some other major problem, and uh, it's pretty advanced, so the only way to treat it is to go in, slice open the carotid artery, and peel out the plaque. So we get a telephone call, and we come in, and they give us one of these sitting in a Petri dish. So we've been cutting these up, measuring all sorts of inflammatory markers. We culture them up to five days in tissue culture, and we um, it <coughs> photograph them. Of course, we've been imaging them. So here's uh, one of our early images of a plaque uh, axial view um, from one of our Myers micro CTs. So you can see the calcification here quite clearly. This is just a single energy, so it's not very interesting. That's more interesting. That is one of our best images of a plaque that was generated, generated by Emily, one of my PhD students, who really probably should be giving this talk when I think about it. So there's the uh, photography on the side showing what this plaque looked like. That big gash down the side here, that's from the surgeon um, slicing it open. We tell the surgeons, look, we'll take whatever plaque you get. We don't care if it comes out in pieces. Just give us what you get. If we get enough of them, we'll get some pretty ones by chance. And that's what's worked very well. So the surgeons don't feel they're under any pressure. We just take whatever they give us. So this one was very interesting. Big brown area over here. Um, Lots of calcification, so you can see in the Mars image, here's the calcification. We know that's calcification because we have tested it, some work done by uh, Joe He and uh, Shisha. Um, but we knew this was calcification right from the word go because you poked it with a needle, it was crunchy. Pretty simple piece of histology. Um, notice this little hole in here. This is actually an eruption. There's actually a big cavity in behind there. I don't have time to show the images, um, but that's probably what blew open and caused the clotting event that led to this patient, the 70-year-old non-smoking. Um, he's a smoker, but he's non-diabetic, and he had a stroke. Um, why he ended up in hospital and how he ended up with his plaque. That brown coloration I showed, that's actually due to iron. So this had a um, plaque rupture previously, and Emily managed to tease out the spectral signature of iron using um, the Mars micro CTs. And we have to clearly see that iron deposit uh, within the plaque. So that's with the magic lens. We've subtracted everything else. And you can see this was a very extensive um, rupture where the blood got right in. It's quite amazing this patient survived this level of um, rupture. So when we showed that the surgeons, they were really pleased that that had been cut out of the patient. We have gone on doing a huge amount of work, um, taking the plaques, cutting them open, comparing what we see to what we see in a Mars image. They match beautifully. And here's some uh, more complicated work done by Shesha, who's going to be talking at the end of the session on his work on calcium in these plaques. But this is a wee bit of his work uh, showing a plaque. Um, this is the Mars energy, just straight energy image, but here's the Mars EMD image. You can see there's iron in here. And when he does histology on it, he's confirmed that patch is actually iron. It um, comes up blue with the histology stains. So we have confirmed that the Mars micro CTs deliver an accurate representation of a plaque at an histology level but it's an excised plaque. What we want to be able to do is achieve the same thing in, with the plaque that's still inside the patient. We want to be able to show the surgeon, yes, this is something you need to remove. Give them confidence and actually let them know what they're going after before they even get to talk to the patient. So we're talking about translating the imaging we get out of this thing to this human-rated large bore scanner we have on the ground floor that you've seen some images from um, yesterday. This is the one that yeah, uh, Phil stuck his foot in. So we're moving towards putting people's necks and other body parts in there to measure, measure the vasculature. One of the 
problems is that we are very cautious and we also want to tell a good story for our students. So we've also focused on peripheral vascular disease recently. Peripheral vascular disease is a big problem, um, especially for diabetics. It's the same disease, but it's happening in the periphery, generally in the legs. You're getting the atherosclerosis building up in the leg arteries. This has caused all sorts of problems like ulcers, poor blood supply to limbs. People end up having toes amputated and all sorts of problems like that. But it's a very easy thing to image because, as you saw, it was very easy for Phil to stick his foot in. So we're actually working up to getting people to put their legs in to look at these leg arteries. So just to make sure we weren't wasting our time, and we are cautious, uh, Emily took a sheep knee. Well, well we, it's New Zealand. We always work with sheep, don't we? And um, basically took a plaque from a human and placed it on the tissue and then placed it in the tissue to see, can we actually see this? We can see the plaques beautiful when they're sitting there in a tube surrounded by air. Can we actually see them when they're sitting in tissue? Because remember, there's not that much difference in the absorption of the x-rays, even when you start playing with uh, the spectrum. So yes, she could see it. So there's the plaque sitting on the surface. This is the actual plaque itself. This is the Mars MD of it. You can see the calcification, quite a lot of lipid. So there's the plaque sitting on top of the knee. So we can definitely see when it's sitting in there. This is a series of slices. That's a 3D image. And when we put it inside, we definitely still get the nice calcification. And if you look very closely, you can make out the plaque inside here. So we definitely can pick it up. So with that confidence, we thought, well, let's go for a neck. Now, necks are attached to shoulders. So at the time, there was quite a lot of concern about shoulders being close to cameras and x-ray sources. So being cautious, we had lots of debates about it for about a week, and during one of those debates, I'm looking at my knee, and I thought, I heard some comment from somebody like Anthony or somebody saying about necks and knees being about the same diameter. So if you put your hand around your knee, and then put it around your neck, it's roughly about the same size. So this is why we went after the knee arteries, because it's actually quite a good mimic of the neck. And you get the disease there as well. So this is the CT angiography, classic CT angiography, 70-year-old 70 male. He has bilateral, basically what that all means is he has calcification in his leg arteries, put it into layman's terms. And this is the image. It's had iodine injected, and you can see this should be a really nice smooth artery, but you can see it's all lumpy, and that's because of the growths, the uh, arthroscopic plaque growing into the lumen restricting the blood flow. And you can see lots of little white focal points. These are most likely calcification. That's what the radiologists um, have said. So hence the comment, heavily calcified multifocal stenosis disease. It sounds as bad as it looks. Um, they've recently had angioplasty, put a balloon catheter in, opened up the artery, and you can see that's really restored the blood throw, flow through here, but not so good through this bifurcation here. So um, the gentleman came in, very gracious. He was a really good patient. Um, we stuck him into this holder that Joe had built um, to hold his leg nice and steady. And uh, we scanned him. Uh, took about 20 minutes, is that correct? Is Jen here? No, she's not. And then we got that image. Now, this image, when I first appeared on my computer screen a couple of days afterwards, just about caused me to fall off my chair. Uh, which had been quite bad because I probably would have broken some bone if somebody wanted to x-ray it. Um, we were just astounded because this is the last thing we expected. We thought we were just going for the calcium. What you can see here quite clearly is the artery wall. Remember, we're looking at a slice here, so some of it appears and disappears. It peters out here, not because we're losing image, because we're actually losing it in the slice. It's moved away. So here's a slice going through, and we're actually just picking up this bit, but it's actually moved in or out of the plane down here. We can see the calcification, but we can see the walls of the artery. So as an astounding result. And remember, there's only about 15, 20 Helmsford units difference here, but because of the spectral nature of our reprocessing, we can actually pick this up quite clearly. And this is without contrast agent. So this is probably the first time. Do you, are you aware of anybody seeing this sort of thing before, Anthony? No. 
Right. So this is a um, bit of a world first, actually seeing the arteries in somebody without contrast agent at this uh, clarity and resolution. So the carotid. So we can definitely see the arteries in the knee, therefore we should be able to do the neck. The big question that's been plaguing us and worrying us for the last two or so years, ever since we discussed it at a conference in CERN many, well, two years ago, is does it move? So there's the carotid bifurcation. This is where we want to image. The artery is coming up here. It's coming off the aortic arch, and the heart's down here. So the blood pressure is thumping through. You put your finger on here, you can feel it pulsating. My argument was you can feel it pulsating because you've got your finger on it. So if you squeeze your garden hose, you can feel the water rushing through it, can't you? Others said it's pulsating because you're getting the pulse going up. So we imaged it. So this is the CT image. You can see uh, this is the standard uh, angiography CT image. And you can see the calcification here, and this is the artery filled up with iodine. And here's the Mars MD of it. Now, this scan didn't go so well. A camera played up. But amazingly, we managed to get enough data to get a reasonable image. There is that calcification, that little arch in this axial view. This is a side view here. This is a single energy. You can see that calcification of the artery. Here's a comparison of the CT that I showed earlier. And there's our Mars image. You can just make out the artery in there. So this is just a single energy. We're still working on this data. So what's next? We want to redo, redo, uh, do this, uh, uh, this analysis, get a patient in, um, get all the usual preclinical stuff done, then do a Mars neck scan. Then we're going to uh, send them off for the usual surgery they're going to get. So this will be a stroke patient. We'll get the plaque and we'll image it. We'll do a whole lot of uh, measurements of its inflammation markers, uh, culture it up, look at how it's responding, try and uh, characterize the nature of that plaque. And then we'll send the patient back for another Mars scan to actually look at their artery after the surgery. And the final goal is basically to turn that on its head because we can't scan everybody. I know it'd be good for the profit line, but we can't do that to everybody. So what we want to do is actually work out which markers in the blood or urine tell us that this thing is there and that the surgeons then need to remove. So that's our overall goal. Thank you.